Good evening and welcome. Tonight is a special night. For many Caxtonians, it has been a while since we have be all been together live. And it's especially wonderful to welcome you here. We want to thank our many guests and all those who will be attending with us virtually next week. It's been a long journey, and we hope you will enjoy. And now, I would like to really introduce what will be the real feature of this evening. I'm going to start with Danny Green, the director and librarian and fellow Caxtonian here at the Newberry Library. And if Danny will introduce our speaker and her topic. Danny, please join us and, with, and give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Jackie. It is, um, it's good to all be back together. Um, and welcome to the Newberry and to the Caxton Club. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce my Newberry Library colleague, Jill Gage, who's the custodian of the John M. Wing Foundation on the History of Printing here at the Newberry. So Jill joined the Newberry staff back in 2004, and she became the custodian of the Wing Collection in 2016. She received her PhD in English Literature from the University of London in 2015, and she holds a BA and MA in English Literature from the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as a master's degree in Library and Information Science from the University of Illinois. So the history of printing is one of Jill's long-standing areas of research and teaching. She actually first came to the Newberry as a master's student when she was studying extra illustration. Um, and those of us who have witnessed Jill speaking about or teaching students or others about the Newberry collection know that her intelligence and her excitement about the collection is infectious. I debated whether I should use that word, infectious. Now, I mean, we're not really, but it is, it is, it's infectious. Um, maybe we're ready for that word, I don't, I don't know. Um, th truly, there's, there's nothing like learning from Jill as she talks about items from the Newberry Collection. She frames questions in ways that are accessible without being oversimplified. I often think of a question that she raised for us in a, um, actually in a promotional video for a library fundraiser, um, when she just asked bluntly, what is a book? To see Jill pose a question like this with students and then to pull apart the strands of an answer to it is to witness something like a master class. It's just such a privilege to think with Jill and to learn from her. Jill's curated multiple exhibitions at the Newberry, including Creating Shakespeare, which opened in 2016. Our current exhibition, A Show of Hands, Handwriting in the Age of Print, relies on the work of staff across the Newberry, but the brilliant curatorial vision is from Jill. As Jill explains when she talks about the exhibition, print technology did not kill handwriting, but it led to multiple evolutions. In a show of hands, Jill delves deeply into handwriting's relationship to technology, to identity, and to art, drawing on the Newberry's unparalleled collection in writing manuals and handwriting. It's a brilliant display of materials covering five centuries, multiple continents, and fascinating and diverse characters. So don't miss this opportunity to take a tour of the exhibition with Jill before it closes in December. Tonight, we're fortunate to hear Jill speak about George Salter, the German-born designer, illustrator, and teacher. After emigrating to the United States in 1934, he established himself as a well-regarded book jacket designer. Salter's collection of some 66 boxes of material came to the Newberry in the 1970s, and a new finding aid was created just a few years back by Georgia Fowler when she worked as an intern at the library. So you can access information about the collection online, and then you can come in to research for yourself in this impressive collection. The Salter collection includes correspondence and notes from classes that he taught, but the bulk of the material, almost 90% of it, contains artworks from his design jobs in Germany and the United States. While he was a coveted book designer, Salter, as the text for tonight's program indicates, considered himself first and foremost a calligrapher and was considered by many to be the best penman of the mid-20th century. 
His skill is evident in the hand lettering he did for nearly all his cover designs. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Jill this evening about the hand lettering on these cover designs. I'm sure you'll all appreciate Jill's remarkable research, her incisive wit, and her passionate storytelling. Thank you again for joining us this evening, and I'm honored to introduce Jill Gage. Okay, so thank you, Danny, for that introduction. Thank you, Caxtonians. It's lovely to be opening the Caxtonian season. Uh, it's like being on the cover of September Vogue, I feel, right? Yeah. And thank you to the calligraphers who have come out en masse. Um, it's great to see everybody here, um, and it's great to be talking about one of my favorite collections at the library. So. In 1968, Lloyd Reynolds wrote to George Salter telling him, the students of my three calligraphy classes agree that you are the maestro of all living penmen. So I will openly admit I messed up the title of the talk a little bit. <laughs> um, You're the maestro of all living penmen. This statement may elicit a number of questions from you, including who was George Salter, although Danny just told us who he was, so. Not a surprise anymore. Who was George Salter? And for that matter, who was Lloyd Reynolds? And also, why was Salter the best living pen man? And finally, why is Jill Gage interested in any of this? To begin with, George Salter was a German-born calligrapher, book and book jacket designer, illustrator, and teacher who revolutionized the world of book jacket design. After serving in the German army during World War I as a map maker, he studied set painting and design at the School of Applied Arts and Crafts in Berlin. Um, he designed for 33 German publishers and produced over 350 designs, most of which were book jackets. He emigrated to America in 1934 and immediately began working with a number of important publishers, ranging from bestsellers like um, for Albert A. Knopf to paperback mysteries and magazines like Ellery Queen magazine and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Many of these um, uh, budget publications came out um, from Mercury Publications, which was owned and operated by Lawrence Spivak, as in Meet the Press, Lawrence Spivak. Um, Salter also taught calligraphy, lettering, and design at Cooper Union in New York City for over 30 years. He continued working up to his death in 1967, and he remains one of the most highly regarded calligraphers and book jacket designers in America. He was the first designer in America to sign his book covers, um, so he's highly collectible. And very charming looking, I think I will say as well. Um, in 1973, um, we acquired, the Newberry acquired the Ar Salter's archive from his widow, Agnes. This collection is nothing short of extraordinary. It contains correspondence between Salter and other calligraphers and designers, including Paul Standard, who we see here in the letter um, to Salter in 1957. And I've been joking um, that calligraphy between, or letters between calligraphers is extremely relaxing. It's like visual ASMR, like it's just, it's very relaxing. Okay, clearly no ASMR fans in the audience. Um, so Lloyd Reynolds, by the way, was another calligrapher, um, and he was an English professor and calligraphy instructor at Reed College. He, um, his students included Steve Jobs, famously, well known for his beautiful calligraphy. Not really. Um, there's also material related to Salter's teaching career, um, and a small amount of material that I love that's about flex, which we see here, which is his lovely ribbon-style typeface that he designed. The bulk of the collection, though, and the most notable part of it is the artwork for his many, many of his jacket designs. So here we see Manhattan, two that he's famous for, Manhattan Transfer and Kafka's The Trial. Um, it's, this is really rare because most publishers do not retain artwork. Uh, we have the Rand McNally archives here at the Newberry, and we get calls on a regular basis. Like, my grandmother worked as a designer for Rand McNally. Do you have her artwork? And the answer is always like, no, I'm sorry, it got thrown away. Um, even at university presses, and it got it didn't wasn't retained. Um, so this is really, really extraordinary. Um, the collection, therefore, provides much information um, about the working life of a highly successful book designer in the mid-20th century. 
And it's especially great to see such a wide variety of work because as I've noted, Salter designed covers for um, now famous, um, very high end literature, including Denison's Winter's Tale, Faulkner's Absalom, Absalon, but also for a lot of inexpensive paperbacks, um, many of which were mysteries and presented really, really wonderful design challenges, I think, and I'll talk about these in a bit. So why am I giving this talk now? Um, in 2019, I had an intern, Georgia Fowler, who created an online finding aid for the collection. And so I spent a lot of time that summer looking through it. And that same year, I began the work of curating the exhibition that is now up, Show of Hands, Handwriting in the Age of Print. So this opened a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, and will run to the end of the year. The exhibition looks at five centuries of handwriting through the lens of printing technologies used to reproduce it. When I, but it took a long time to get to that point of figuring out what the exhibition would be about. And when I would tell people that I was working on a handwriting exhibition, I would often get responses like, oh, I love calligraphy, like wedding invitations. Um, and I always thought this was really funny because most wedding invitations today are printed. I know some calligraphers will probably be like, no, I totally calligraph wedding invitations all the time. But for most people, what they're referring, what they're responding to is not the act of writing, not the practice of writing, but the letter forms themselves. Um, and whereas Salter's really interesting because conversely, he was a calligrapher who made lettering and he hand lettered almost all of his books in their entirety. So when you look at a Salter book, even if it looks like the most typographic thing you've ever seen, it's hand lettered. So this is his hand lettering uh, for a little book called Police at the Funeral that's clearly a typewriter font style of hand. Um, but even though his work often looked typographic, he very much considered himself a calligrapher. And originally I was 100% certain that I was going to include some of his work in the show. Angry Dust and the Missing Miniature, and these are just absolutely delightful. For years, these were at the top of my list for the exhibition, and things would just fall off the list and get added to it, and I was so adamant that it was Salter, Salter, Salter. Um, okay, so spoiler alert, they are not in the exhibition. And um, it's not because I don't love them, um, but actually because I did not think that I would be able to fully tell their story in the exhibition. So labels, we get uh, 50 words on a label, and um, that's perfect for the exhibition, but I just thought I would really be selling this work short because I wouldn't be able to explain it, and it would simply be get subsumed beneath um, other works in the exhibition. So I decided that I would prefer to do an exhibition dedicated to his work, or at least to book design or book jackets, which I think would be a really fascinating exhibition for the Newberry. But I wanted to use this opportunity to put more of Salter's work out there and to begin to think through some of these things for myself. So the artwork in the collection includes not just the final art or the final proofs, but drafts and notes and comments as well. And this is what makes it so special. Um, Salter often made notes for the printer or possibly for himself. I do apologize. I took a lot of these photos in the reading room and I got a lot of shadows on them. Um, there are lots of comments about what colors he wants and especially comments about the lettering. So many times he'll write to himself almost don't crowd the letters or um, don't squeeze your letters or don't let the letters spread. I'll talk more about fabulous people, which is on the right in a minute. Um, but his most voluminous notes uh, were for his more complicated projects, and they're often about the color separations. So this is The Wall by John Hersey, which is about the Warsaw Ghetto. And um, these, this is the color separation for the, his notes for the yellow alone, which is um, uh, just one of the, I think it's four colors. Um, but it's very, very complicated. Um, it's clear that from notes like these that Salter paid enormous attention to detail. Even with more budget, um, budget level productions, this is evident. Um, and one of my favorite examples of this is from a little book titled F as in Flight, in which he created a teeny tiny oops, little handwritten check, um, which he tore up and then pasted onto the cover. So this check 
in the collection, it's maybe two inches, maybe two inches, so it's tiny. Um, but he hand lettered that and then ripped it up. Um, my favorite note in the collection, though, relates to this book, The Fabulous People, uh, which is about a group of people in pre-World War II Tokyo. He writes to an unnamed correspondent at Knopf, stating, if you should like it, the cover, as much as I do, but haven't got enough money for it, I could and would do these. Lettering separate, so there will be no separation. If that isn't enough, we can drop color three, red, or convert it into a flat tint. If that isn't enough, I'd write the blurb myself, which I would like to do anyway, looking for trouble. If that isn't enough, we flatten the blue. If that isn't enough, we skip the blue. If that isn't enough, we skip everything and just print C inside. I wish they would have done that. That would be incredible, right? Um, he, he adds, or we could do another one, less crazy. We can be simple, too. And just FYI, this is the cover they kept. I love this letter because, first of all, it's so aware of design and the publication of design, but it also highlights Salter's incredible wit, um, and um, English was his second language, um, which is evidenced throughout the collection. I think that we also see his wit in the lettering at the top, which we see here, um, which is the figural letters, which are great fun, which are often found in early modern writing books, particularly Italian. I've used a copy from an English manuscript writing book. Um, these are very common. I, I think they're quite fun. Um, and he's playing on that here, but he has very modern characters as the components of the lettering. Um, so he was very much a 20th century calligrapher who was deeply knowledgeable about historical letter forms, but he used such styles in unconventional ways. Not all of his lettering was unconventional, but it was always adroit. Salter believed that text was part of an image, not distinct from it. His design for the trial um, by Kafka is a masterful example of this integration, so I'd like to quickly walk you through the changes he made from the, his draft, which is on your left, to the final cover on the right. Um, Kafka, this was one of his favorite books that he worked on. He was the first person in America to design the, for uh, Kafka covers, and he came back to it again and again throughout his career. The final cover features a courtroom scene that straddles the line be between reality and fantasy, with an, asse an assembly comprised of penciled figures who seem imaginary or bored. One of those two things. The title, again, we're looking at the right-hand side, the title, The Trial, obscures the faces of these figures, the serifs of, of the R, um, the I, and the A, all cover up someone's eyes, while the T resembles an injurious anvil um, in the process of squashing the man below it. Together, the inscrutability of the figures and the lettering on top of them conjure up the haziness, darkness, and feeling of suffocation that permeates the novel. Are these already blurry figures under threat of being snuffed out by the word trial? The mood here isn't entirely dire, as the curled terminal of the R um, adds what I read as a tiny bit of humor, a little graphic wink. Meanwhile, the A mirrors the figure in the center of the cover, whose outstretched arm seems to invite the reader to open the book and see inside. The center figure of the A and the A draw the eye diagonally to the blank space in the bottom left, um, where more penciled men look to be in the process of being erased, and Kafka's name seem to have, seems to have blown in from the side. And so look especially at the bendiness of the A here. That, that lettering just looks as it, there's, so one thing you'll hear me hear, say again and again is there's such movement to his lettering. It always looks like it's doing something, and here it seems like it's just kind of blown in. Um, so, in comparing the finished work with the original draft on the left, one can see the design decisions that ultimately make the cover work so well. The original lettering is more squeezed together and the R is different. Its terminal even dips a bit below um, the baseline as if trying to escape or perhaps kick its neighbor. And instead of covering up the faces of the assembly, the lettering here actually cradles them. I especially love the face resting on the serifs of I and A. 
I sort of wish Salter had kept this, although admittedly it's a little bit distracting. But it's these tiny changes, these are tiny, tiny changes to lettering that seem inconsequential until you look at it um, more carefully. But I think it's these tiny changes that really make it work, and that's why he was so good at what he did. I said that he came back to the trial again and again throughout his career and towards the end of his life. He was involved in um, trying to make a calligraphed edition, an entirely calligraphed edition of the trial. And he did this. He actually did this for Walden, for Thoreau's Walden, or as a selection from Walden, which I have at home. Um, and he really felt that, the, that writing this by hand with these little illustrations interspersed throughout would be very effective. And this was never realized before his death, but we do have his, lots of his notes and his trials for this. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that Salter's lettering is often awkward, although I mean that in the best possible way. Um, Many times I will be I will examine the lettering on a particular piece and thinks that and think that it looks odd and shouldn't work, but somehow it does. For example, on the cover of the Pinball Murders, which is one of my favorites, um, and all of these, when I go through these, all of these, I just think I have to read that book immediately. Like, what is the Pinball Murders? Um, so the spacing here of the lettering seems off at first. The PI of pinball are squeezed together while the A spreads out, um, perhaps rather like someone standing at a pinball machine or perhaps someone who has been, um, had a pinball machine fall on them. Um, we see the same thing with the U in murders. It really sort of takes its time or it spreads itself out. The serifs, especially on the L, are, me are clearly meant to resemble the, resemble the flippers of a pinball machine. The whole effect creates an instability, a movement, or kineticism, not unlike a pinball machine. Um, and one can imagine a ball pinging away its way around this cover. So in full disclosure, I played a ton of pinball in my 20s, so I'm like super, super into this cover. Um, the Pinball Murders was part of, a, of the Jonathan Press imprint published by Lawrence Spivak. And that series is one of my favorites because Salter was limited in his design choices, which I think always fosters creativity. I worked with a book designer last year on a project, and he wanted a lot of parameters. He thought the worst thing you could say to him was, do whatever you want. Um, even though I ended up saying, do whatever you want. Um, so one of the parameters here, and oh, before I um, go into this, Two important things to note. These were published at a time when we started to see a lot of lurid pulp covers. So when we think of like the 50s and 60s, we think of like really lurid covers. Salter was not into that at all. Um, he did not go in that direction. He didn't like it, and he didn't use it in his own work. Also, in general, Salter began his design work by reading the book, which seems kind of obvious. Um, he wanted to get at the core or essence of the book with its cover. But he did not like mysteries, so he made his wife Agnes read them and give him a synopsis. Um, so I would have loved to have been able to listen to them talk about these books because he's illustrating them through her, um, through her descriptions. Oh, and the same book designer I worked with told me that he thinks it's really difficult to deal with dead bodies on book covers. So I really appreciate the creativity he put into figuring out ways to pose bodies on here. Um, so the design constraint for this series was um, that this black rectangle or black square appeared on every cover. Um, I don't really understand why that was a design constraint, um, but that's what it was. Um, and so it's fascinating to look at how he uses it, whether it's a chimney or a wall or a hallway, or sometimes people are just kind of falling through it. Um, it's totally fascinating, but I think it serves as a great backdrop to the different lettering styles. And here, again, he's just playing with different lettering styles. Um, and some of them look typographic. He's great at mixing different styles. Um, he's really creative and, and kind of loose with them. Um, and I, I would love to know more. We don't have a lot of notes for these. I would love to know more about how he made decisions for lettering styles when it's not apparent what, they, what he's doing. Um, my absolute favorite part of the collection at the moment, however, oops, can you hear, still hear me? Um, are the designs for a series called Bestseller Mysteries. These covers were almost purely textual, 
although they often had tiny, extremely witty illustrations sprinkled throughout the, into the lettering, sort of a reverse of grander covers on which the image or illustration is the first thing the reader notices. Here, the illustration, if we look at um, You'll Fry Tomorrow, the illustration literally hangs off the lettering. Um, and it's in this series that Salter gives what I would consider a master class in lettering. The only thing that's different about these covers as we go through are the color of the background and his lettering. Everything else, there's no variation in it. Um, so here we see a typewriter style lettering, which is actually different than the um, typewritten words we see at the bottom. And of everything in the PowerPoint that we've seen thus far, that little typewritten blurb from the New York Times is the only thing that's printed, the only thing that's not hand lettered. Um, Cops and Robbers on the right has such a lumbering quality, I think. So looking at the bowls and shoulders of the letters, we see a chunkiness, but also kind of a pinched look that I think goes really well with the little figure who's just sort of passed out on the park bed, on the bench. I also would never have guessed that O. Henry wrote crime stories, but maybe I'm not a big O. Henry fan. Um, and here, as with my comment about the pinball murders, there's always a liveliness to the lettering. So look at Too Lovely to Live. Like, it's so fizzy. It seems alive. Um, and the same with um, Dead Yesterday. So even here, there's a movement to the letters. Even when he grounds them by literally blacking out the bowls and, and the eyes of, you know, dead yesterday. Um, so there's, a, there's always something is happening. You feel like something's happening in these. And then with Agatha Christie and Rex Stout, Salter shows off more traditional styles of lettering. Um, he doesn't use, so where there's a will, he doesn't use that kind of style very often. Um, the style that we see on Poirot investigates, he's, He's a fan of that, so he uses it quite a lot. Um, there are literally hundreds of these in the collection, and they're all different. You could spend a week looking at them, and you wouldn't see two that are the same. You wouldn't see two that feature the exact same combination of lettering. Um, it must have been something that he did to make it fun for himself, um, partially. Um, I'm going to end with the two covers that I decided to put in the exhibition. Um, when Salter did covers that were meant to look handwritten, as these do, there was such a relaxed, informal quality to them. Angry Dust on the left is a novel about a young Russian man, and this is a style that Salter had used very effectively before, this kind of diary, what I would call a diary style, or he just completely fills um, the cover with writing. But it's not calligraphy. It's, it's a handwriting. It's actually not really his handwriting either, which I think is fascinating. Um, but he completely fills the cover. This is the second time he's done that. He has did that. Um, the first time was on a, a very well-known German novel called Alexander Berlin Plots, which is uh, the story of a working class man who gets out of prison and falls into the underworld. It's a really stream of consciousness novel, so you can understand why he might do a cover like this. Um, it's uh, sort of the daily life of a man, what happens in a working man's life. It was a huge success. It's one of his best, the German cover is one of his best known. I'm not sure exactly why he decided to basically recreate that cover on um, a book called Angry Dust, uh, which is not nearly as good a book as um, the German book. But the fact that it's an autobiography perhaps made him want to reuse this style. The Missing Miniature on the right is also a peripatetic novel about a sensitive butcher um, who ends up in Copenhagen and agrees to transport a miniature painting back to Germany. The book is a comedic thriller, and we have the sketch for it. So this is the first sketch that we have where he's already thinking about cursive. Um, on there. And then we have a truly wonderful draft on the left. And I really, I think, I sometimes regret not putting this exhibition because it's so wonderful because it shows how important it 
is to have legible cursive, right? Because if you look on it at the draft, it is the listing lineature, right? That doesn't look like an M at all. Um, so it's great to be able to have the final product where he actually changes it um, to make it much more legible as the missing miniature uh, for those who read for pleasure. I don't really know else why you would read, but that's okay. Um, George Salter, like all the best calligraphers, makes me think differently about handwriting and calligraphy and letter forms. He makes me see letters anew. In going through his, his papers these last few weeks, though, I was struck by how tiny his own handwriting often was. Um, and it's often shocking to realize that calligraphers don't have perfect, beautiful handwriting all the time, except for the people who are over here, who I'm sure do have beautiful handwriting all the time. Um, I wanted to show one of Salter's letters so I started going through a little notebook of drafts that he kept, and purely by accident, I stumbled across this one from 1965, and this is a draft to a woman named Martha Utterback, who was a curator at a museum in Texas specializing in Texas history, which this is, was very mysterious to me. His letter was a response to one from her asking him to contribute to a calligraphy exhibition. He writes that he would be happy to contribute and said that his preference was for calligraphy in book work, adding, the strongest experiment of creative and progressive calligraphy is the book jacket. That is not only true in the United States, but for most book producing countries. I've been designing books and book jackets for 37 years on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. The amount of calligraphy that I've been able to use is substantial. I've always considered calligraphy to be the wellspring of all letter forms the matter that inspires all graphic form of communication, and that includes type. He then goes on to discuss the 1965 Baltimore exhibition, 2,000 Years of Calligraphy, and so it's the same year as he's writing the letter, calling it an undertaking of a gigantic scope. At the same time, he adds, it fails in its message simply because it has none. That's his quote. It fails in its message because it has none, which, ouch, <laughs> really. Um, the mistake, of course, he writes, lies in the, mid in the misdirection of the 20th century, which shows calligraphy today in retrospective nostalgia of earlier days. In any century, calligraphy must be conscious of that century. It must live in that century. At the beginning of this talk, I asked why Lloyd Reynolds thought that Salter was the greatest living penman. And I think that it was because of this. It was because of his belief that calligraphy wasn't trapped in amber. It was a constant, evolving art form. And to survive, it had to be put in conversation with, it could be in conversation with older art forms like we saw in um, The Fabulous People, but it had to move forward. It had to evolve for readers and for practitioners. I hope that you have, so that's it. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed Salter's work as much as I have, and I hope that I have tempted at least some of you to um, see inside the collection. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions about Salter. So thank you. This was terrific. Thank you. Um, it, he had a command of production values that are phenomenal, which yeah. I, I think gave him an advantage in dealing with the publishers, I mean, that little, that story you trip through, that if this doesn't work, then we could do this, and if that doesn't work, then we could do this. It was like, there was no way out for the, for his client. You know? Right, yeah. I think he, I think he could probably talk people into anything, but he had, one of the things that's so fascinating is his knowledge of, of the production values. Like, I have, and there's so many little notes throughout where he knows exactly how something is going to print, and he knows and um, or what they can do to make it different, what they can do to make it cheaper, how they can change it. So it's really fascinating that he had all of that in his head and an artistic vision as well. That was so good. Um, so and he was so cognizant of that. Um, so I there's so much of those that throughout the collection though, um, and the even the color separation stuff. He just he. Also had a really good sense of how things would look when it was printed. So that was there too. So it was 
really, you know, one of the things, you know, my whole thing is I'm interested in handwriting and print, and that was what he was so good at, was understanding how handwriting and his calligraphy and his letter forms were going to look in print, um, and how that would work in conjunction with other parts of the cover as well. Jill, I'm still trying to work through the dynamics of your very early comment to the fact that it's unusual that all of his drawings are in his papers. Mm -hmm. So he worked for several high-end publishers, right? Knopf and Random House, et cetera, all of whom you would think either would have kept the artwork or thrown it out. But did you ever find any evidence that contractually he demanded the return of his artwork because otherwise the work he did from all the publishers would have been the property of the publisher, which I know well from the University of Chicago Press Archive, and you're right, they didn't keep much of it. That's a really good question. It's something I've thought about. So he was a freelancer, um, and I think he must have had it contractually written in that he retained um, the artwork or that if they did not want to keep it, he wanted it sent back. We don't have everything, so uh, as much as we have, there's a lot that we don't. And I think he had a really good working relationship with Knopf. He was friends, personal friends with Mr. Knopf, so um, we have more Knopf stuff than, say, Random House, for example, or Houghton Mifflin. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, if he had been in house, I think it would it would be gone. Um, he clearly was also interested, though. I'm always really interested in people who understand enough to archive themselves early on, who have a sense of that, and perhaps it um, perhaps some of it came from being an immigrant and having to leave a lot of things. I don't know how much he had to leave behind in Germany. I'm not really sure about that. Um, so perhaps he was particularly sensitive to, to that as well. Also because he was a teacher, um, I think um, he had a lot of students and so much of the correspondence talked about um, people saying, thank you for my career, really. He was clearly, so I think he might have also thought about it as teaching opportunity or teaching material or just wanted to have a sense of that. So he was really good at archiving himself, as was his wife. She wrote tons of great notes on stuff as well. So, sorry. Thanks, Jill. This, well, thanks, this was great. Um, at, at this, um, I'm curious about the moment of immigration and he's, mid 30s late 30s right um is do you see that um as you look at his design do you see rupture do you see continuity with um in the immigrant you know in the kind of before and after with an immigration process what's his german work is totally fascinating and it's quite diff it's not entirely different but it's quite different than his american work one of the really thing, interesting things about him, and I hope I'm not speaking out of turn too much, he, once he got here, he was like, I'm American. Like, I'm going to add an E to my name. I'm, um, you know, so he really learns English. So I don't know. I, it's interesting to see what kinds of work he wants to do. Like, he's so interested in Kafka, for example, and he's really drawn, like a lot of the high-end work is al it's always like about the Warsaw Ghetto or it's like Tokyo before the war. So it clearly was very affecting to him and he liked working on that. And I'm not, it would be interesting to look at his style more over time and see how it matches up with other American work. His work did look very, it, it did look different, but it did, it also looked American, if that makes sense. So it's one of the reasons I think he's super interesting um, is this place that he finds for himself almost immediately. So not long after he gets here, they have retrospectives of his work at like Columbia mm -hmm. and things like that. So he was already really well known, but he does change his style.
Thank you for that brilliant talk. Um, I'm curious about him signing his name on these. Um, is there any understanding of him trying to like fashion his own identity, or was there any pushback against this? It seems so rare. He was already well known in Germany, and I think that he signed his name on books in Germany. I think it was more common than it was here. So I think he got here and said, "Well, I'm signing my name on that." It is really interesting as a in terms of ownership, though, and this identity and that carrying over that identity. Um, and it's so distinctive that you, it's so funny that he signed his name because his work is so distinctive that if you're in a bookshop, I can always be like, that's a salter, that's a salter, that's a salter after a while. Um, but he was just already really well known as well. And, and I think that's probably part of why he was able to work as a freelancer here. Um, he commanded, I can't remember how much he got for the Kafka, which was in the 30s, but maybe $2,000 or $3,000. I mean, it was a lot of money. And later on, there's um, something from someone at Knopf who said, we thought this was insane at the time we gave it to you, and now it seems like a bargain. Um, so I, I think that was probably just his way first of, of finding work and distinguishing himself, um, but clearly self-fashioning as well. Yeah. I'm curious about the observation you made when you're looking at the sketches and the iterations, and the phrase was tiny changes in lettering. Yeah. And coming from the creative side of this, I, it, because you identify things in the interpretation, I thought were dead on. I mean, they, there were things, but there, there's a moment when you're actually in the creation of it, and you just there's an intuitive sense, this is right. Yeah. You know, I haven't explained it to myself yet, but this is right. And then you could see the refinement, so it was close to something, mm -hmm. and then the refinement really made it click. And I, I just think that that's, that's an interesting interplay, and I'd really be interested to know what the dialogue was that was going on between the client and Salter. I think it was him. I think that he just massaged it until it looked right. And as I said, a lot of times I would look at, I look at it and think, that looks so weird. You know, and um, it clearly was his way of working and, and his style of just always lettering things when he could have easily used type for a lot of this. But he just changes things just enough and it looks good. Like, and maybe, maybe, and as some, like if people are designers or calligraphers, maybe you can speak more to this, throwing people's eye off a little bit. So there's just something just odd enough that makes you stop and look at it. It doesn't look too perfect, too similar. There's just something that draws you to it. Um, I would love to think more. I would love to think more about the design part of it. And it would be fun to work on a project with designers or calligraphers on this. Like this is really who this collection is for. Um, so, and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to give the talk tonight because I really wish more people would come look at it. It's so rich and so wonderful. And it'd be a really fun project to work on together with a group of designers, perhaps, um, thinking about it. Right, Jackie? It would be, well, this is, will be one of the Caxton on the move tours in the very near future because we, we really do want to find out more about this and this great collection. There's one more question. We're gonna take one more for tonight. I will just say that we're free and open to the public age 14 and older. And, and this crowd is 14 and older. If they're trying to say they're not, we'll um, disabuse them of that. One more question. I, I don't like to have the last word, but I, uh, following up on what you were saying about the weirdness of some of the lettering, I, I wonder if those deliberately awkward pieces that you pointed to are mostly in the down market mm. material and whether he felt that was more important or more appropriate to yeah. the to the mystery type stuff and the and that particular audience. Well, that's one of the reasons that I was interested in the lettering for the trial because it's not awkward looking at all. It's quite beautiful, but some the there are things that are just slightly they're not off or odd, but they're just not 
he just makes these tiny changes. I do wonder about that as well, if he just felt freer and more creative with the, the more budget options, or it would be interesting to go through and look at that. I think you're probably right with that. Part of it, I think he had to do hundreds of them um, and uh, felt had just a lot of creative freedom in them probably as well. With, with there being no more questions, I want to extend a warm thank you to our presenter, Jill Gage. It's really wonderful to have you. Please accept our warm applause. And, and now, it is the custom of the Caxton Club to always present our speaker with a copy of one of our books. Jill Gage has already been a speaker to the Caxton Club a number of times, more than can be counted. Further, we suspect that more are to come. Therefore, it is with great pleasure I present a book printed for the Caxton Club in 1935. To achieve this feat, we selected a group to scope this out. I would like to thank Paul Gale for his advice. And I would like to thank Eric Salter for the fact that he too was a good book scout. The Caxton Club looks for volunteers everywhere to do many things. And we want to thank you for that and present this copy to Jill Gage. Thank you. I'm hoping that all of you have had the opportunity to sign the plate for Jill's book. If not, please contact me up here at the table and I will make sure that happens yet tonight. It has been wonderful to see you all. Thank you, and we will see you for the rest of this Caxton year. Thank you very much.